practical message with you today that I hope will be of some encouragement. It's about coping through tough times. How can we triumph in spite of our trials? Uh, the Bible's pretty clear that there are trials in life. Everybody at some point is going to experience varying degrees of trouble. You can read in Ecclesiastes chapter 2 verse 23, For all of his days are sorrowful and his work burdensome. Even in the night his heart takes no rest. Paul said, All that live godly, this is 2 Timothy 3.12, uh, All that live godly will suffer persecution. And Paul, he was strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them, Continue in the faith, saying, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. It is through tribulation we enter the kingdom. Everybody experiences tough times. So this is something I hope would relate. Now you may not know it that the people around you are having trials. Um, we usually are very polite. How are you doing? Fine. How are you? Fine. Very seldom do we I want to admit to people the things we might be struggling with. It could be the person you're sitting next to has experienced some terrible financial disaster or bankruptcy. Or they got a report from the doctor that uh, they've got a very serious health problem and you had no idea. Or there's some strife or crisis at home. Or there's just intense loneliness in their lives. There's all kinds of people are struggling with all kinds of problems. And uh, how do we bear up under that. Uh, most folks are, are put on a good front. I'm, I'm doing fine. Uh, we don't really, and you know, nobody wants to hear everybody unload all of the problems all of the time, but we, uh, <laughs> you and I know a few people, you ask them how they are and you kind of regret you asked them. <laughs> but uh, I know there's no one like that here. <laughs> I remember hearing a story about this New Yorker that was driving across Texas and he got involved in a pretty serious collision with a pickup truck that was pulling a horse trailer with a horse. And the Texas Ranger came over to him, he was lying in the side of the road and he said, are you alright? He said, I'm fine. Well a few months later he was in a court in Texas and he's trying to recover damages for his injuries. And the insurance lawyer said, no wait a second you told the policeman at the scene that you were fine. He said, you need the whole story. He said, they were pulling that horse trailer and then we had this terrible wreck. I heard someone say, the horse broke his leg. The ranger went over and shot the horse and then he comes over, he says, how are you? <laughs> so what did you expect me to say? <laughs> but there are trials. Oswald Chambers said, Suffering is the heritage of the lost, of the saved, and of the Son of God. Each one ends on a cross. The bad thief is crucified, the repentant thief is crucified, and the Son of God is crucified. And so trouble reaches everybody at some point in varying degrees. But don't be discouraged. In spite of that, uh, we can have joy and we can have faith. You can read where Jesus said, uh, of course, that uh, in this life you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. All that live godly will suffer persecution. St. Augustine said, God had one son on earth without sin, but he never had one without suffering. So all of us experience varying degrees of suffering. Now, I'll make, make something for you very simple. If you want to understand the trials that you go through in a kind of a divine perspective, everything is going to fall into one of two categories, and often both. In your struggles, God is trying to do something in you. That's one. And in your struggles, God is wanting to do something through you. And often He's wanting to do something in you and through you. It's both. But with that sort of as a background, keep in mind there are about ten reasons. Well, it's not a comprehensive list, but I've come up with ten reasons. Those of you who like lists, you might want to write some of these down. Why does God allow us to go through trials? Sometimes if you know there's a purpose behind it, it's a lot easier to deal with, right? 
if we just can know, is there some reason for this? Is something good coming out of it? Then it makes it a lot easier to handle. So here are some of the common reasons, according to the Bible, that people go through trials, trouble, suffering, tribulation. First of all, he wants to help us recognize our spiritual need. So some of it is for us. It's redemptive. The Bible says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And God may have blessed you with physical poverty so you might know your spiritual poverty. Our different trials that we go through are designed to help us know that. Second Chronicles 32, 31. God withdrew from Hezekiah in order to test him that he might know all that was in his heart. Hezekiah thought he was rich and increased with goods and he didn't realize he had a lot of pride in his heart. So God, now God didn't back off so God could find out. God knows everything, right? The Bible says Jesus knew what was in man. He did it so that Hezekiah could realize, maybe I'm not as holy as I thought. God sends messengers to find out about Jehovah and instead all he does is talk about his stuff. You ever gone through a trial and the Lord showed you something about yourself you didn't know? Exodus 9, 27, And the Pharaoh said to them, I have sinned this time. The Lord is righteous and my people are wicked. Even the Pharaoh came to the place where he realized his wickedness as he went through the trial of the plagues that came on Egypt. So that's one thing. Number two, God sometimes allows us to go through trials to humble us because God if you kick the devil out for pride, we're not going into heaven with our pride. We need to humble ourselves, which is very hard. Deuteronomy 8.3 So he humbled you. He allowed you to hunger and to feed you with manna, which you did not know, nor your fathers know, that he might make you know that man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus, of course, quotes this to the devil, the proudest of all, in the wilderness. He humbled them that they might come to depend on God. They went through trials where they not only ran out of food, they ran out of water and they had to turn to God. They were attacked by their enemies. They learned on a daily basis that they had to depend on God. It's humbling, but it's healthy. Ezra 8.21 Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river, Oliva, that we might humble ourselves before God. You know, sometimes fasting is sort of like self-induced trial, self-denial, and part of that represents we're humbling ourselves before God. Matthew 26, 75, and Peter remembered the words of Jesus when he said, before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. Peter had been bragging, though all men should forsake you, I'll not forsake you. And he went through this terrible trial so he could find out something in his own heart and he realized, I'm not near as loyal as I thought I was. And the Bible says he went out and he wept bitterly. So that trial accomplished something in Peter and it also is a warning to us. Another reason we go through trials is point number three is to help us with our priorities, to prioritize things correctly. You remember God said to Abraham, you love me, I love you. He said, okay, take your son, your only son, who you love, bring him to the mountains of Moriah and offer him there as an offering. Well, Lord, I love you, but you know, actually I love my son more. Now, he didn't say that. He put God first. Now, do you think that was a trial for Abraham? It was. Sometimes you'll go through a trial because you may have an idol in your life. It could be somebody. It could be something that is more important to you than God and God may touch that person or that thing to get your attention. It wasn't just Abraham with his son. How many of you remember Jephthah with his daughter? He made a vow, Lord, you give me victory. Whatever it is that comes through the gates of my house, I'll offer it to you. And the first thing through the gates was not his ox or his goat or sheep, it was his daughter. He said, Alas, my daughter, I have opened my mouth to the Lord and I cannot go back. Doesn't Jesus say, Unless you love me more than the husband, wife, child, son, daughter, you're not worthy of the kingdom. Father, mother, Jesus needs first place. Trials sometimes help us to recognize what our priorities are and to get them straight. Another reason we sometimes go through trouble is quite honestly simply to 
separate us from sin. It's God's discipline. It's a fire of suffering that often brings forth the gold of godliness. I was talking to Sam out in the lobby and he quoted that verse. I said, that's in my sermon today. You're stealing it from me early. First Peter, you know, just a, a side note, um, probably 10% of the times the word suffer or suffering appears in the New Testament is in First Peter. And of course Jesus told Peter how he was going to die, that he would die through crucifixion. And uh, when Peter wrote his letter, the people of God were going through a lot of trials. You read reports of some of the early church fathers when they came together for their conventions. I'm talking about like, you know, 100 A.D., 150 A.D., they'd come together for a church council. And one historian said there was scarcely one person there that wasn't missing a leg, an arm, a foot, an eye, something, because they had been tortured uh, for Christ in some way. So they were all maimed. They all had scars, chain scars or something because of what they'd endured for Christ. We don't have too many scars in suffering for Christ. But um, sometimes God allows us to go through these things. It's, it's a discipline. 1 Peter 4, 1 and 2, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his life in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. Hebrews 12, 10, For they indeed for a few days chastened us, as seemed best to them, but He, God, for our profit, that we might be partakers of His holiness. Now so sometimes God allows us to go through suffering, and I'm going to spend a moment on this, because it's a chastening. Now, how many of you are parents? I won't ask you how you chasten your children, but how many of you lived in the great generation that believed in the rod, or the belt, or the switch, or the willow, and you survived. How many of you that raised your hand believed it wasn't that bad? <laughs> and the Bible has a lot to say about that. Let me hear this. Is, you take this up with the Lord. I'm going to probably get a call from the officials, but this is what the Bible says. Hebrews 12 verse 4, you've not yet resisted to bloodshed striving against sin. There's a struggle sometimes with temptation. And you've forgotten the exhortation that speaks to you as sons. My son, do not despise the chasing of the Lord, or be discouraged when you're rebuked by Him. For whom the Lord loves, He chastens, and He scourges every son who He receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom the Father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which you've become partakers, then you are illegitimate, not sons. Furthermore, if we have human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect, shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? Submit to his chastening, in other words. For they indeed for a few days, earthly fathers for a few days, chastened us as seemed best to them. But he for our prophets, sometimes parents don't do it for the best motives in the best way, they're doing their best. But he said, God always does it for a prophet, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Sometimes you're going through trials and God is allowing it that he can refine you and you can be a partaker of his holiness. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. I remember my Uncle Harry, my father's brother, telling me a story one time about Grandma Bachelor. Now, Grandma Bachelor was a very tough um, woman. She was a Baptist. She lived in Oklahoma during the days of the Dust Bowl. Some of you know your history, or if you've ever read the book Grapes of Wrath, my dad kind of lived through that epic. And uh, after the Depression, or in the midst of the Depression, uh, my father's father died and left Grandma Bachelor with three sons and one in the oven, as they say. And she worked sewing for Levi Strauss sewing overalls. And she was tough, trying to keep three boys in line during the Depression. That's, that's a hard job. And my Uncle Harry told me when he got to be 15 years old, he made a big mistake. He was bigger than Grandma Bachelor. 
And uh, he said, uh, I told her one day, she told me to do something. I said, I don't have to, and I'm bigger than you, and you can't make me. I don't know why you'd ever say something so sassy. She looked at him and she said, maybe not, but I can make you wish you listened to me. <laughs> then he tells that one night while he was sleeping, early in the morning, she woke up and they had those metal frame beds, you know, and she very quietly tied, she took some socks or something, she tied at least one foot and both hands to the frame of the bed while he was sleeping. <laughs> she knew that he slept the sleep of a teenager and he wouldn't wake up. And then she got a broomstick <laughs> and she came in, she took a deep breath and she just began to wallop on his thighs and he woke up thinking he's having a nightmare, howling, thrashing, trying to get away and she just laid into him, <laughs> beat him hip and thigh. Then she sat down, she rested <laughs> and he's whimpering and moaning and <laughs> she said, I'm going to rest a minute and she said, I'm going to hit you some more. <laughs> and she said, and you are never going to talk back to me again. And she kept her word and he said, I never ever sassed my mother again. <laughs> That's what you call the peaceable fruit of righteousness. <laughs> Now, I'm not recommending you do this at home. <laughs> Don't try this at home. But those were the good old days <laughs> where uh, you, you never dared talk back to your mother and your father. Amen. Job 5.17, Behold, happy is the man whom God corrects. Therefore do not despise the chastening of the Almighty for whom he bruises but he binds up. He wounds, but his hands make whole. And again it says, Proverbs 3, verse 11 to 12, My son, do not despise the chasing of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom he loves, he corrects. And you know, the Bible talks about some children that were not corrected by their parents. Like it talks about David did not correct Adonijah, and he became very, uh, a lot of bad behavior. Eli would not correct his sons and he lost his sons. It was for sons and daughters. And again, I'm not talking about corporal punishment, but I'm talking about the chastening of the Lord. Sometimes to save us because he loves us. Now there's a couple times my father spanked me. Somebody threw a rock from our house and he hit the neighbor's house down below and my dad lined us all up and said, who did it? And we all said we didn't do it, but he was sure I did and I got spanked. <laughs> and I didn't do it. But you know, I didn't hold it against my father because I thought of all the times I did do things he didn't know about. And so I figured it evened out somehow. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Parents make mistakes, but what about all the times you did something wrong and you didn't get in trouble or you blamed it on your sibling and they got in trouble and so it sort of evens out at some point. So he does it to save us. Number five, Sometimes we go through trials because it helps us to focus on heaven. Romans 8.18 18, Romans 8.18 18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed. You know as you think ahead and you look at heaven it gives us peace in knowing that uh, you can endure almost anything if you know it's not going to last it reminds you that whatever suffering you have now, it's not going to last. And the sufferings of this life is like just a drop of water and then look at an ocean. I mean, you might have a hard time in this life for that one drop of water, but God is going to give you an ocean of pleasure at His right hand forevermore that you can't comprehend through eternity. So to patiently endure the struggles of this life, though they seem to be long, is really nothing, Paul is saying, by comparison with the glory that God has in store for those that love Him. Can you say amen? amen? You know, a boxer can stay in the ring and endure all kinds of punches when he considers the prize, the title. And I don't recommend bro boxing, it's a brutal sport, but I used to watch it and uh, my, my mother dated a fellow that was big into boxing for years and, and there was this one fight in New York City some of you remember Muhammad Ali, Cassius Clay when I was a kid and he fought with Joe Frazier and it's one of the few fights that Muhammad Ali lost 
And they stood toe-to-toe -to -toe in the ring, and they beat on each other for 15 rounds, two heavyweight boxers. And Muhammad Ali got knocked out a couple times, and, and he was in pretty bad shape. After the fight, he was in the locker room, and he's on the table, and the doctor's checking on him, because he's bleeding, he's swollen, he's bruised. And Diana Ross, the singer, came in, and she saw him, and she fell down at the table. She's on her knees, and she's crying. He said, I know I'm not pretty anymore. He said, but don't cry for me, Diana. I just got paid two million dollars to get beat up. <laughs> he could handle it when he thought about the prize. <laughs> and we've got to keep our mind on the prize, that this is not going to last forever. There's a number of promises in the Bible. 2 Corinthians 4.17, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things that are seen, but the things that are not seen. Think about the reward. Revelation 21, the reason God tells us there's a world where God is going to wipe away every tear, no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. That sort of summarizes a lot of the struggles we have in this life. He says, don't worry, there's going to be a world where there's none of that. And he's promised us that. Number six, one reason God allows us to go through trials is so more, we're more appreciative of the times we're not going through trials. Have you noticed sometimes when you're surrounded with blessings, you can get where you take it for granted. Sometimes our children take their blessings for granted because they don't know what it's like to do without. Amen. I've heard that... Um, it's really good for your kids to go on a mission trip. I've heard a lot of stories about kids that, you know, they're an American. They, they got all the latest of this and that. They won't wear jeans and pants and shoes unless they're designer and name brand. And, you know, they, $150 for a pair of tennis shoes. And then they go on a mission trip to India where the kids don't have any shoes and they're still happy. And it does something to kind of reprioritize when they get home helps them understand the value. So uh, Job 29. Now Job is going through his trials. Listen to what he thinks of. He's going through a terrible trial and you all know. Job 29 4. Just as I was in the days of my prime, you can hear him with nostalgia looking back, when the friendly counsel of God was over my tent, when the Almighty was yet with me, when my children were around me, when my steps were bathed in cream and the rock poured out rivers of oil for me. He's looking back and thinking, boy, I just had so many blessings. So going through the trial, you start appreciating the blessings. And then when the trial's over, you think, you know, I've really got it good now. How many of you think back on the good old days? Sometimes, whenever they were. Some of you might be in the good old days right now and you don't know it. And you won't know it until you go through a trial later. Isn't that right? Amen. So we appreciate God's blessings. Point number seven. Another reason we have trouble is to help us help others. I told you that God allows these things to do something in us and often to do something through us. Job was afflicted and uh, he might have wondered why is this happening and he and his friends spent a whole book talking about why an innocent man would suffer. How many people, how many millions of people have been encouraged by the patience of Job? Even James refers to the patience of Job where we see that in the end God is good and we're, we're realizing there's a battle behind the scenes and as you look at the trials that Job goes through he maybe couldn't see it then from his perspective but we can see looking back that uh, God sometimes allows these things to teach us and to help others. Notice 2 Corinthians 1 verse 3. Now this is a, this is a little bit of a deep verse, so you've got to follow me. Paul sometimes waxes eloquent here. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Now that's the operative word. Who comforts us in all of our tribulation. Why? That we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble. The sermon's about how to get through trouble. Why do we go through trouble? That we might comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. 
For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, our consolation also abounds through Christ. We're consoling others. Now if we're afflicted, it's for your consolation and salvation, which is effective in during the same sufferings that we also suffer. Or we are comforted with your consolation and salvation. You know, um, pastors do funerals. And it always seems a little strange when a young pastor, and I was once a young pastor, and you're trying to comfort these seasoned people who are mature and they've lived a long time as they're experiencing loss, and you haven't really experienced any real loss like that. And you're trying to tell them all the secrets of life, and you got all these platitudes and sayings. And, and, um, but you start losing some loved ones, your s funeral services start changing. And I've got a friend. You know, we lost a son a few years ago. That's the hardest thing you could, you could go through by far. And um, another friend lost a son. And I went to his funeral. And he stood and he shook hands with all the people after the service that were going in line. But when I came to the line, he stopped and he hugged me because he knew that I knew what he was going through. And so I was able to give him comfort that no one else could give him because of the trouble I went through. So whatever you're going through, God even might be using it to discipline you, but it could have multiple purposes. <laughs> one of them being that whenever you get through it, you will be able to relate to another person and help them. Amen. A friend was telling me they were in the hospital for some procedure and uh, uh, a nurse came in and had to turn them and they said, that nurse was like it, it, Attila the Hun, just came in and just threw me around and I'm in pain and I'm going, ow, 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 ow. And so the next day another nurse, a different nurse came in and they had to turn them and they were so, they said, is this okay? How's this? Are we going too fast? And they were so considerate and finally they got them settled down and they had to say to the nurse, they said, I just got to tell you, I really appreciate your being sensitive and gentle because yesterday, boy, I had a nurse that was like a professional wrestler came in here just <laughs> throwing me around and, and the nurse said, well, I'll tell you, I've had the same surgery that you've had. I know how you feel. And so when you're going through some kind of trial or something, just say, all right, Lord, I don't know what I've done to deserve this, but maybe you didn't do anything to deserve it. Maybe he's going to use it later to help somebody else. So, one of the reasons we go through our trials is that we can be a comfort to others Amen. that are going through suffering. Amen. You know, I've got a um, bottle of Rice Dream. I drink Rice Dream with my cereal, and it's got uh, a little sign on top. Karen wondered what I was doing. I went into the refrigerator yesterday. I pulled out the Rice Dream. I read it. And I put it away. And she said, "What are you doing?" I said, "Sermon illustration." It's a shake before using. <laughs> Sometimes God's got to shake you before He can use you. You've probably seen medicine bottles before. It says shake before using. You shake well. <laughs> Some of you have been shaken up quite a bit, huh? And a very, another very simple principle in why we go through troubles and suffering is to grow Christian virtue. 1 Peter 1.6 in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little time, if need be, you've been grieved by various trials, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than that of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus. James says in James 1 verse 2, My brethren, count it all joy. How many of you think, oh joy, when you're going through a trial? Count it all joy when you fall into various trials knowing, just know, see if you know there's a purpose, that God has got a purpose in it, that the testing of your faith, it's helping you develop faith, produces patience. You know when the Bible says, he that endures to the end will be saved, that word endurance is patience. Let patience have its perfect work. Now why would he say let patience have its perfect work? Except that it's possible for you not to make the most of your trials. Say, Lord, 
I will embrace whatever it is you're trying to teach me through this. Somebody said one time, if your parents striking you with a rod, draw close to them. It always lessens the blow if you draw close to the one who holds the rod. If you embrace your trials and say, Lord, I, whatever you want to learn, teach me. You remember one time David got in trouble. He was proud. He was numbering Israel. And Nathan the prophet came to him and he said, look, I, I left you a little bit to test you and look what you did. You thought that all of the power of the kingdom was in the number. He said, David, how, how, that's unlike you. You went against a giant all by yourself. It never had to do with numbers. And now you think your power is the numbers of the people? So I'm going to send a plague. I, I'm going to send one of three punishments. It's like a parent asking a kid, now do you want a spanking? Or do you want, you know, a week without food? Or whatever it is, you know. <laughs> and uh, any of you ever give your kids choice? Isn't that terrible? <laughs> you let them, here's your choice. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, David, he could have picked from one of three things. And you know, David said, I am going to fall into the hands of the Lord whatever you decide, Lord, and if it's a judgment from you, I'd rather fall into your hands than man's hands. Amen. And so sometimes you just draw near to God in those trials. You know what? God shortened what was going to be the punishment because David submitted and he humbled himself before the Lord. Romans 5.3, again we're talking about you develop Christian virtue. And not only that, but we glory in tribulations. Do you all joy in tribulations? Do you glory in tribulations? Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. How many of you want to have characters fit for heaven? How many of you want trials? If only trials produce character, will you embrace it? You know, I remember uh, hearing about a pastor, James Brooks, he's an author, went to visit a person's home and while he was waiting for the lady of the house he heard this singing of a melody in the corner and he walked over, he thought there was somebody there but it was actually a bird that had learned to sing the melody of a hymn. Now usually they just chatter a word or two. And the woman of the house came into the room, he said, I've never seen a goldfinch sing a song before. But he said, she said, yeah it's hard to do but you can't do it during the day because they get distracted. You can only do it at night. And she says, I sat hour after hour by her cage and I would hum that melody and hum that melody and hum that melody, but you have to do it in the dark. And sometimes we only learn those things in the dark. The Bible tells us that uh, Job 35.10, my maker who gives songs in the night Helen Keller said, although the world is full of suffering, it is also full of overcoming of it. Amen. How does a mother eagle teach its young to fly? Stirs up the nest. All right, number nine, for those that are still counting. Sometimes we go through trials as a warning to others. There was a thief on the cross when Jesus died and he confessed. Luke 23, 40. He said, do you not even fear God seeing that you're under the same condemnation? We indeed justly for we receive the reward for our deeds. Now how many of us have been encouraged by that thief that turned to the Lord in the final hours of his life and found mercy? And you've got to be careful. This is the story of someone being saved in the 11th hour. And I remember Matthew Henry said, there is only one example of a person being saved in the eleventh hour in the Bible so that nobody would lose hope. Only one exa example so nobody would dare to presume to wait until the eleventh hour. But we're glad it's there. But that man's trial is there as a warning to others. And he said that we're getting what we deserve. I don't know if you've seen it but uh, there's been a television commercial that's been running lately of a lady that is speaking through one of those devices when you lose your sound box they've got a battery powered amplified device and you can kind of talk when you press it and it's, it makes a robotic sound, you all know what I'm talking about, it's, a, it's an unusual sound and she's doing the commercial, she's saying this is what I got from smoking she said I'm going through a trial but maybe it's not a waste if you can learn from my mistake how many of you parents are hoping that your kids can learn from your mistakes instead of making the same mistakes? 
But a school of hard knocks usually is the best, huh? 1 Corinthians 10, 6. Now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did, talking about the experience of the children of Israel. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and they rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 fell on a day. We must, not, we, we, must put Christ, uh, we must not put Christ to the test, or tempt the Lord, as they did, and were destroyed by serpents, or grumble as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happen to them as examples, but they are written down for our instruction on whom the ends of the world have come. And so one thing that we do is we learn from their experience so we don't have to repeat the same mistakes. Number 10, we go through trials that God might be glorified. Somehow, sometimes God is simply glorified in some way through the trials we experience. Why did Jesus say Lazarus got sick? Because he ate too much sugar? And or did Jesus tell the disciples, it's for the glory of God? I didn't heal him right away, for the glory of God. John chapter 9, now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and the disciples want to know, why? What, did, did he somehow do something wrong, or did God know he was going to go bad, or was it his parents' sin, or are we trying to figure out why? You know what Jesus said? Neither. But that the works of God should be revealed in him. God was going to be glorified in a great way through his healing. Now that man had been blind. He wasn't very old. He had just come of age. So he's like 18, 20 years old. And uh, he'd been blind his whole life. And you might think, well, what a terrible thing to be blind your whole life. And the Lord allow that, that he might be glorified. But how good did that man feel when he got his sight? And how long is that affliction compared to eternity if he's healed by Jesus and he has everlasting life? So Paul said we shouldn't question the potter saying, why did you make one vessel like this or one vessel like that? We've got to trust that God's God and he knows what he's doing, right? I used to always wonder, why was I born healthy and my brother was cystic fibrosis? But if God can be glorified in it, I was able to pray with my brother before he died. And he asked Jesus in his heart. John 21, Jesus said to Peter, Most assuredly, when you are old, when, you, when you're young, you did what you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands. Another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. He spoke this, signifying by what death he would glorify God. Acts 5, 41, They departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing they were worthy to suffer shame for his name, that God could be glorified in it. Romans 8, 16, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, and heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may be glorified together. Amen. So if you know that somehow whatever trials or trouble or suffering you're going through in this life is going to mean increased glory, then you make it easier to embrace that. So those are ten points. There are other things, but you know, one thing you should just keep in mind. Um, sometimes we don't learn except through trouble. Have you learned that pain is a great instructor? There are lessons you learn in pain that you won't learn any other way. I've got something I'd like to share with you. Do not hold a spark plug wire when someone is turning over the ignition. <laughs> I have learned that it is not 12 volts that will go through you, but because of the capacitor, you will experience 10,000 volts. Ask me how I know that. <laughs> Ask me how I know you don't want to touch your disc brakes after you park the car, that they're very hot. <laughs> I will never do that again. I have learned that lesson. You know, one of the things that illustrated this for me was, uh, I got a lot of stories I could tell you at this point. I don't want to go too long, but... Um, I was driving the bulldozer through the woods and uh, all of a sudden I thought someone shot me. 
you know, they got hunters that shoot up there. I, I, I thought I got shot. And then I got shot again. I realized I wasn't being shot. I was being stung by hornets. I had parked right on top of a yellow jacket's nest with a bulldozer and they didn't like that. Well, bulldozers don't drive very fast and I thought, I got to get out of here. You ever get to realize you're being stung by a bee? You run as fast as you can. When you feel pain like that, you run as fast as you can. I jumped off that thing and I ran and I'm swinging, they're following me. I think I got stung three or four times, I don't know. Very painful. Problem was the bulldozers were still running up there on top of their nest. And I thought, I, got, I can't leave it there all day. And I thought, well, what do I do? I didn't have any beekeeper equipment. So I thought, well, I got a snowmobile suit for winter. So I went and put on a snowmobile. This is summer. I put on a snowmobile suit and I put on one of those hoodies that you wear when you're skiing. Looks like you're going to rob a bank or go skiing. <laughs> and then I had to put on a pair of goggles and I put on a pair of gloves and I put duct tape. I didn't want them going up my sleeves. And I went and I climbed back on the dozer and I got out of there. Now before I climbed on the dozer I stood in front of the mirror and I took a picture of myself. I took a selfie because <laughs> I thought... Now the reason I tell you this story is that was a particular place in a field. There's nothing descriptive about it but it's this particular spot in the field where that nest was. The bees have relocated uh, 20 years ago, whatever it was. I cannot drive past that spot without remembering that experience. You notice that when you have pain it really helps you. And God wired us like that or you wouldn't survive. You'd keep touching the stove if you didn't remember. But He helps us remember the things that hurt for your survival. So when you're going through a trial sometimes I say, Lord if I'm doing this because it's something you want to teach me, please teach me now. Don't be afraid of trials. Yes, life is tough for everybody. Amen? Yeah. You don't have to be afraid. Who was it that said, uh, a man who fears suffering is already suffering from what he fears. Thomas A. Kempis said, he who knows how to suffer will enjoy much peace. Such a one is a conqueror of himself and Lord of the world, a friend of Christ and an heir of heaven. Don't fear trials. Jesus said, John 16, 33, these things I've spoken to you that in me you might have peace. In the world you can have tribulation. Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. You know the Bible tells us that um, Christ suffered for us. Amen. Hebrews 2, 9, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor. Christ in the garden said, Lord if there's any way not to drink this cup, but he drank it that he might taste death for every man. For it was fitting for him for whom are all things, by whom all things are, in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. So if he's our captain and he suffers, we should know that he can bring good of it. Even the thief, I'm sorry, even the soldier by the cross of Jesus saw Christ in his sufferings. He saw him say, Father forgive them and through beholding his sufferings he said, surely this is the Son of God. When Christians know how to joyfully and patiently bear our sufferings, it sometimes is the very best opportunity to witness. Amen? Amen. And God is working in us. I'll close with a little poem that uh, you may have heard before someone once shared. It's called The Oyster and the Pearl. There once was an oyster whose story I'll tell who found that some sand had slipped into his shell. Just one little grain, but it gave him such pain. For oysters are feelings, although they're quite plain. Now did he berate the working of fate, which had led him to such a deplorable state? No, he said to himself as he lay on the shelf, if I can't remove it, I'll try to improve it. So the years rolled on by as years always do, and he came to his ultimate destiny, stew. I don't recommend oyster stew. But the small grain of sand which had bothered him so was a beautiful pearl all richly aglow. Now this tale has a moral, for isn't it grand what an oyster can do with a morsel of sand? What couldn't we do if we'd only begin to enrich and embrace what gets under our skin? God allows trials because He loves you. We need to learn how to just see it 
through a heavenly perspective, nothing is going to, the pain won't last. It's all temporary. And just say, Lord, help me to avoid bringing sufferings on myself. If I suffer for your sake, let me rejoice. Jesus said, be exceedingly glad. And to remember that uh, he suffered, and it is an honor to be able to suffer as a Christian. Amen.